Hey church, I hope you're doing well. So you, you might know if you were able to join with us last week that we're in Lent. You probably know that even if you weren't able to join with us last week. But last week I issued us a challenge, a dare. And as I did that, we looked at the the life of Christ in particular. We looked at Jesus going into the wilderness after being baptized by, by John and, and the Holy Spirit descending upon him as a dove and the Father saying out loud to, to anyone who could hear, this is my son whom I love, I'm well pleased with him. And then he goes into the wilderness where he is issued a challenge. Uh, actually, a, a couple challenges. One from the Father, one in line with the Spirit, full of the Spirit. He went into the wilderness where he refrained from food and water for 40 days. And so that's the, the challenge from God. Will you, will you be faithful to this? The other was a challenge, or multiple challenges, by the devil. Will you feed yourself? And, and turn this stone into bread? Will you throw yourself off of this building and, and not get injured and, and put the Lord to the test? Or, or will you uh, worship me and give, be given power and authority over all of this stuff? Jesus faced these dares, and he was able, by knowing his identity, to, to remain true to the challenge of the Father and the Spirit, to main, remain in communion with them while not falling for the temptations of the devil. And so as we're in the season of Lent that reflects on Jesus' journey in the wilderness, it is also an opportunity for us to do self-reflection, for us to prepare for the Easter season, for us to, to look within ourselves under the guidance of the Spirit of God and to say, well, where do we need improvement? Where might we grow closer to Christ? Where might we become better disciples? And so with all of that in mind, we've been issued a dare, an opportunity for us to engage in this disciplined and rewarding experiment. Dare, D-A-R-E, disciplined and rewarding experiment, where we're looking at some of the spiritual disciplines and we're engaging in those over the season of Lent, finding out that they will be rewarding to us and to our faith into our life with Christ. Now, discipline sounds a little negative, but really it just means those practices that, that people of faith have put into good use over time, over history. These are, are things that, that people engage in regularly, and it bears fruit. It, it makes a difference in the life of believers who engage in these things. And so we want to engage in the disciplines because we trust that in this process, God will meet us and will continue to cause us to grow closer to him. All right, so we've, we've done all of that groundwork. Now it's time in to dive in to the disciplines, to engage in the dare. And as we start, I want to take us back to our school age once more. Last week, we envisioned, you know, a merry-go-round and, and being challenged to get on it and, and different things like that. This week, I want for us to picture not the playground, but inside the classroom. And I dare you, I dare you to say the S word. Can't you picture it? You can hear the teacher. All right, class, as we leave today, don't forget to take your textbooks. We have a test coming up, and I need you to study. There, I said it. I said the S word. That's a, a word that can cause us to feel a little bit uncomfortable. In fact, I said two words that can cause us to be a little uncomfortable, study and test. But, but for today, we're, we're looking at the study one. Need for you to study. That's, that's a... A rough one for some of us. Not, most of us don't really enjoy that art of studying. We, we don't really find much pleasure in our idea of studying for the most part. Or at least we can have struggled with it at least at some point in our life. And, and there's many approaches to study and, and some of them are good, better than others, but but it's important for us to, to know and to understand that study plays a role in our life. 
So let's talk about a couple of them here real quick before we dive into studying uh, what we need to study in a spiritual disciplined way. All right, so as I was a, a kid, there were a few ways that you could study. One of them I tried in college mostly, and that was the whole uh, read the entire book, stay up all night, and try to cram as much into the old noggin as I could the day before and hoping to regurgitate some of that out the next day. The, the cram it in study method, all nighter, working hard for a wee little bit of time and hoping that it pays dividends. That's not a good method. Okay for maybe some short-term games, a gains long-term bad method. Another method of study that you might have used is, is studying by rote, where we use rote memorization, just repeating things over and over and over and over again. I, I remember being in class as a young elementary school student, and apparently we were learning our math uh, factors, you know, two times two is four, four times four is 16, on and on. Apparently the class had a hard time with six times eight. That was one that, that everybody missed. And so I think the teacher at that time thought, well, we'll just repeat that. Six times eight is 48. Six times eight is 48, six times eight is 48. And we said that over and over and over again. So that one's stuck in there, six times eight, 48, no big deal. That is there because it's been put there by repetition, by rote. Maybe the same teacher wanted to show us how we could learn bigger spelling words. And so another one that I know uh, by rote from those early days is how to spell the word ichthyopterius. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. One you spell all the time, I-C-H-T-H-Y-O-P-H-T-H-I-R-I-U-S. You are welcome to look it up. I'm pretty sure I have that right. It's a fish disease where they get little white spots on it. Ichthyopterius. I remember that from elementary school because we re repeated it often and the teacher, I think, wanted to show us that we could learn big words. Anyway, by rote. That's another method of study. Other people say that you, you should study in a distanced way and it was spread out over time so you you study some here you study some there you study some there you engage the material over a season of time and that's a way to study some people say study with music and so you listen to tchaikovsky don't ask me to spell that one didn't learn that one by rote but you you study to tchaikovsky and the music and then the the things go in your brain in a different way, and then as you're taking your test or remembering the information, the same music helps you recall all that information. Other people like to study with quiet and silence. There's lots of ways that we might study. But for us, on our spiritual journey, the, the thing that is most important when we think of the discipline of study is studying the Word. This is the thing that we really want to study. And there's some reason contained within the word why this might be the case. For instance, if you look in Deuteronomy and you look at chapter 6, verses 4 and on through 9, you'll hear this as a command of God, as a, a thing that, that the people of Israel are to do. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Here in Deuteronomy, the Israelites, the, the chosen people of God, are told to have the commandments, which we can read as, as the word of God, have, have these commandments of God everywhere, on their foreheads, on their hands, on their doorposts, on their gateposts, anywhere that they might be able to see them, they, they are to be aware of what God has said, to study them, to, to know them. This is study by immersion just completely surrounded by the, the Word of God so that it might be on their hearts. And in fact, that's, that's something that we hear 
even later um, in Jeremiah about the word, uh, this, this complete immersion, not, not just surrounding us and studying us, studying externally, but, but Jeremiah says this in chapter, sorry, in chapter 31, uh, verse 33. He, he says this as a promise from God, I will put my law in their minds and will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And so here is a, another place where, where studying and knowing the word of God becomes important. It, from Moses in our first passage, we, we hear that we're to, to put the commands of God all over the place, on our minds, on our hands, on the doorways, on the gate posts, so that wherever we are, we are studying the word and, and knowing it. And then Jeremiah continues, not only do we know it externally, but God says, I'll put my word on your hearts. I'll put it right there on your mind. And, and this is the passage that the writer of Hebrews quotes in chapter 10. Verse 16, he, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Even the New Testament says there's this time with the covenant people where, where God's law won't just be an external thing, where the word of God won't just be in the surrounding environment, but will be an internal thing as well, where it will dwell on our hearts and our minds. And so knowing the word becomes important. One thing I want to mention before we get into the actual study part, it's neat to, to read that and hear who is making the promise, right? God says, I will put my word there. I will put my word on their hearts. I will put my word in their minds. And so we, we can approach the study of scripture with a little less worry than we might approach a test. I mean, reverence and respect, but not worry like we're cramming it all in to get some exam. For, for God is, is an active player in this whole conversation. God said, I, I'll put my word there. And so it's not that we're trying to jam it all in by ourselves and, and hope that we might pass the test, but we're participating with God as he places his very word in our hearts, in our, in our minds. And so study becomes this opportunity for us to participate in what God wants us to do, to participate in what God wants to do in us. If we remember 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, uh, 16 and 17, it reminds us that all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And if we think about that, that implies if we're, we're teaching and correcting and rebuking and being trained in righteousness, that implies that we know it. And in my experience, the best way to know something is to spend time in it. After all, that's the goal of study, right? Uh, that should be the goal. I mean, sometimes in school we study because we want to get a grade. But if we really study something, we study it because we want to know it. If I really wanted to know about ichthyopterius, I would study fish and how that disease impacts them and how that impacts other creatures and wildlife and the environment and all that stuff. You, you study what you want to, to know and learn and understand. And so even though God is the, the main actor, the, the main one to do the, the action in this occasion, God is the one to put the word in our hearts and in our minds, we need to fulfill our role and participate with God by spending time in his word so that we might know the word better so that we might know the lord better the study becomes an important discipline for us an important practice for us spending time in the word spending time with the word 
who is Jesus, made, made flesh. Spending time in the scriptures helps us to spend time with God and subsequently to know God better, which is the goal of study. Now, like studying for school, there are different approaches that we might take in reading the Bible. We, we might take uh, uh, an approach where we try to read through the whole, whole entire thing, and, and we try to do that in a certain period of time, and that has value, and that is, that is good, and that's a, a practice that we might do in different seasons of our lives. There's other processes of study, like inductive Bible study, and that's a, a whole area where, where you can learn and grow and how to study the Bible that way. We might study the, the scriptures by trying to understand their context and, and the cultural significance of the word. And so we might refer to commentaries or we might use concordances to see how words relate and, and look at the Bible in terms of outlines and structures and themes and studying in all of these different ways. And all of that is is wonderful and great and good, but for our purposes in this season, the one that I want for us to focus on, and, and maybe it's because it's the one that I tend to skip, is this practice of studying the Word that looks more like meditation. And for that, we can turn back to Psalm number one. And, and you might remember this Psalm. But, but listen to these words. This comes from Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. They are like a, a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf, leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law, they meditate day and night. Now, meditation can be a word that we associate with more Eastern religions, and that idea is emptying ourselves into there's nothing there. And that's not the scriptural, biblical view of meditation. And scripturally, Biblically, it's filling instead of emptying. It's filling ourselves with the, with the word, with the law, with the commands, with the, the word made flesh, with Christ. It's filling ourselves. And so as we read scripture, it's this ruminating, remembering, not just in a rote way, but allowing the words to repeat and go through us and to really capture our hearts and our minds, our imaginations and our spirits, to spend time reflecting and dwelling on short little passages of scripture and that that would be part of our study and that would help us to know God. There's a Latin phrase for this type of study, and I'm sure I'll butcher the pronunciation, Lexio, Lexio Divina. That's my best attempt, at least for now. And, and this practice can be remembered as a way of meditating on the scripture by another acronym. So the acronym that we might use for that is to pray. And, and so this approach to scripture is a helpful way to study God's word. And the acronym for pray, uh, I'll explain each letter, and, and it will help us to remember how to meditate on the Word of God. So P, we pause. Before you open the Word, before you dive in to the Bible, you, you pause. And in that pause, you allow yourself to focus on God. And you think about God's goodness and God's love, and you begin to have this conversation with God, where you welcome God into your, your time together, which hopefully you're doing anyway, but, but you pause for a moment before jumping into the scripture and center yourself on God, or you ask God to center yourself on God. You, you focus on God, so pray, P, pause. And then the next step is the R, which is to read and reflect. 
read over a short passage of scripture, maybe a few verses, maybe half a chapter, maybe a little bit more, but not super far. You, you, you read through it to get an idea of what the scripture is saying, and then you read through it again more slowly, and you reflect on if any particular part of that passage is jumping out at you, it is speaking to you louder than others. And so you, you read about that and you reflect on that passage for a little bit. And let's say you're reading the passage of Jesus healing the lame man that was lowered through the ceiling to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, take up your mat and walk. And you hear those words. You see those words. They're going on in your brain. And you imagine the scene. You picture the scenario. Take up your mat and walk. And maybe you go to where how that person would have felt or the shock that would have been present for all those gathered. Take up your mat and walk. And you just allow those words to penetrate into your heart and into your mind as you read and reflect. So you've paused, P, you've read and reflected, R, and then you ask, which is the A. You ask God to show you where you might Take up your own mat and walk, for instance. Where are the instances in your life where you, where you need to respond in faith to something that God has told you to do? Or, or maybe you, you ask God, well, well where, is, where is it that I can be an encouragement to somebody else in their faith and to have them take up a mat and walk? Or maybe there's some other way that God has led you in asking over that particular passage. But the point is to, to take this passage of scripture that you've read and reflected upon, that you've pondered and you've sat and you've marinated in for a while, that you've meditated upon, and then you turn that scripture into a prayer. And you ask God to work within your life however he was speaking or, or to work within somebody else's life however he was speaking to you at that moment. Pause, read and react. Ask. And then why? Yield. Surrender to the will of God. And lay your life before Jesus at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, I, I, I've paused, I've read and re re reflected, I have asked, and now I yield to your will. Whatever it is that is best for me in this moment, whatever it is that is best for you and for your kingdom in this time, I yield to your will. And so that's one approach to reading scripture, one approach to studying the word. And it's a, an approach that I encourage you to, to try if you haven't. I dare you to say the S word. And not only just to say the S word, but to practice the S word and study the scriptures over this season. The time spent in the word of God with a, a willing and open heart and mind is time well spent. It, it will draw us closer to Jesus as, as we hear God's word and as we spend time coming to know our Lord better. And so friends, I, I ask you as we wrap it up today, will, will you dare to study? I mean, maybe you need to do that, that plow through the whole Bible way. Maybe you've never read through the whole thing, and that's something that, that needs to happen. Will you, will you start that now? Or, or maybe you need to have a better understanding of how the stories are interconnected into the big story of Christ. And, and maybe that's something that you need to work on piecing together. Will you start that study now? Or, or maybe you need to get into a group with other people and have conversation about the Bible and have study in a group of people so that you might help learn the word better. Will, will you do that now? Or maybe you need to engage in this practice of Lectio Divina, that you need to spend time meditating, marinating, ruminating, chewing the cud just like a cow, having it go over and over, not just for rope memorization, but to know 
Christ and to know him crucified and, and to know the life that he has offered you. Maybe you need to study in that way. Whatever God is asking you, asking of you this day, I pray that we'll be people of the word and we would study it, that it would dwell within our hearts, that what was said in Deuteronomy would be true of us, that we would hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. May the word dwell deeply within you as you become more like Jesus and encourage others to do the same. For God's sake, for his glory, for your good. Amen.